For day 12, I want you solely to focus on the gastrointestinal system. Give yourself a break from calculations. So I want you to go through inflammatory bowel disease and IBS, C. difficile infection, constipation and diarrhea, dyspepsia, uh, H. pylori infection, NSAIDs, and liver and pancreatic enzymes. So as you can see, H. pylori and C. difficile, although they're infectious disease topics, are covered in the gastrointestinal system module and chapter. So I will include two free videos for the gastrointestinal system here for you to watch. And I will see you on day 13. Right, so hello again everyone. My name is Enketia and I am one of your clinical educators on the microphone platform. And this module is going to be focusing on chapter one of the BNF, which is all about gastroenterology. Specifically in today's session, we're going to be looking at constipation. Now, as far as the clinical aspect of the GPHC assessment, I've always said before, and I'll say again, that your key to success is really understanding the clinical side. You're not just remembering facts for the sake of remembering facts. The aim of you learning all of this clinical content is in the hope that when you qualify, you would be able to use it either to make recommendations, um, to clinically validate prescriptions and see whether things are being used in accordance with NICE guidance or any local guidelines, and also for you to make safe recommendations to patients. So please do make sure that you are looking at all of this and learning it in context. On that note, it's also important to try and read content multiple times. It's a completely unfair expectation for you to read your BNF once and then expect to remember it to an exam standard. I know for a fact that when I was revising for the clinical components of the GPHC assessment, um, not only did I read my BNF multiple times, I wrote notes and I went over notes. Um, and it's also worth just applying your knowledge to questions earlier on. And there's a whole wealth of questions, um, a lot within the microphone platform itself. So please do make use of those resources. In terms of understanding the weighting of the exam, so not all 15 chapters of the BNF are equal. Um, all the questions in part two that relate to clinical care are linked to key therapeutic areas. And it's worth noting the weighting given to individual therapeutic areas uh, is shown on the table in the next slide. Generally, the weighting is reflective of the amount of critical medications, how prevalent the disease state is. Um, and so anything that's highlighted in red is your high weighting. And this could be 60 to 70% of the questions. Um, things are orange, are more medium weighted, so 25 to 35%. And then your green is low weighting, so up to 10% of the questions. Uh, your gastrointestinal uh, or GI uh, is all medium weighted, so it's worth knowing that actually in terms of spending your time after you've gone through your high weighted topics, gastro is really one of the areas that you want to sort of spend some time on. Finally, in terms of the takeaway messages, it's not impossible at all. Um, you've learned about all these different systems as part of your MFARM degree. So I'm sure you're more than capable of relearning them now um, in preparation for the registration assessment. But without further ado, let's move on to looking at constipation. So in terms of your symptoms of constipation, um, really we're looking at the definition of difficulty passing stools and a sensation of incomplete emptying of the bowels. NICE generally defines this as less than three times a week. Um, and other symptoms may include excessive straining, lower abdominal pain because of straining, or discomfort and bloating. Now, as is the case with a lot of clinical uh, sort of syndromes and conditions, the management should really include any underlying secondary causes in addressing those, and then advising or reducing pharmacotherapy that might be causing or contributing to symptoms. So let's say, if, for instance, and this is entirely possible in practice, a patient comes in and they say, oh, well, I've got a bit of pain and I've been using lots and lots of codeine and now I'm constipated. Well, yes, you could say, OK, well, let's put you on an osmotic laxative and a stimulant laxative to get the gut going again. Well, ask yourself, can we reduce the dose of codeine or can we get rid of the codeine full stop? Since we know that codeine is incredibly constipating. So, again, this is where you need to try and think about the patient holistically. 
okay and, and the patient in front of you will then help you determine what the best course of action is there may be some patients in which stopping the coding isn't appropriate um but then there might be patients in which it is so think about the wider context here now generally what we will say is in terms of the management of constipation we would advise in any lifestyle measures like increasing dietary intake of fiber fluid and activity level uh, in some instances, we might say reduce the amount of caffeine that you have, uh, since caffeine can have different effects on different people. It can cause constipation in some uh, or diarrhea in others. In terms of your actual classes of laxatives, we can start off your bulk forming laxatives like especula husk. Okay, and the idea here is that similar to fiber, um, they swell in the guts to increase fecal mass to stimulate peristalsis. These generally work within 24 hours, but can take two to three days to full effect. Because they mimic the action of fiber in some respect, you would not take this before bed because the idea here is that by bulk forming, um, it increases fecal mass to stimulate peristalsis. If someone's lying down and they're not moving very much, you're not going to have very much peristalsis. So you're going to see this swelling in the gut and no movement, okay, uh, which can cause fecal obstruction. So you would probably advise not to take it before bed, but generally you would recommend increasing your, your fluid intake. Osmotic laxatives, so this is your standard macrogol, lactulose. Um, these generally work by increasing water in the colon by drawing fluid from the body or retaining fluid administered with it. These are just sugars that will just swell up with lots and lots of water and then help pass everything through. Lactose in particular can cause osmotic diarrhea of low frugal pH as well. These will also work within two to three days, but then lactose will work in 48 hours. Just a bit of a side note here, one of the things that I see in practice all the time uh, is like, like say, Laxido PRN. Um, and whilst that's not entirely wrong, you need to ask yourself, well, if something's being given PRN, you generally want an immediate effect. So when you know that macro goals generally work or take two to three days to work, is it really an appropriate PRN drug? Probably not. That's probably what you'd reserve your stimulants for. Your osmotic laxatives generally have side effects like discomfort, flatulence, cramping, and nausea, uh, the latter of which you can generally reduce by administering with water or with fruit juice. Your stimulant laxatives uh, generally will increase your intestinal motility by irritating the gut lining. Glycerol suppositories will work between 15 to 30 minutes. Your others will work within 6 to 12 hours. Generally, your side effects will include abdominal cramps. Continuous use can also cause lazy bowel, and I'm sure a lot of you know that there have been um, memos that have gone out where stimulant laxatives at one point were being abused for weight loss. Um, there is very little or no evidence to support that stimulant laxatives can cause healthy weight loss, um, and that's actually part of the reason as to why you can no longer buy large packs of Senna or other stimulant laxatives uh, at corner shops and are restricted to pharmacies only. Um, so that could very well be a question for your general knowledge in the registration assessment because whilst that's more legislation, it does still relate to gastroenterology, so just keep that in mind. In terms of your other points for constipation, uh, Dantron is a stimulant laxatives but is genotoxic and carcinogenic. Um, your side effects generally include red urine, local irritation and excoriation, so we would only really reserve it for palliative care. but in working in palliative care in there, I've never seen it be used in, in my neck of the woods anyway. So fairly outdated drug. Your fecal softeners like liquid paraffin generally are not advised either because they can cause anal seepage, liquid pneumonia, uh, and granulomatous disease of the GI tract as well, which can affect the absorption of fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K. Um, you can use other fecal softeners like methyl cellulose, sodium docusate, and glycerol. In some instances where two laxatives have been tried and failed um, at the higher possible doses for six months or so, you could consider brucalipride or uh, lubipristone. I tend to see brucalipride more in practice. Um, but if the constipation is opioid induced, you may want to consider an osmotic docusate and a stimulant or naloxagol or methyl naltrexone. And these will work peripherally in the gut without undoing the analgesic effect of the opioid. So really, really effective drugs. In children, we generally would encourage use of osmotic laxatives. 
um, and behavioral intervention. So is it a dietary issue? Is it that you need to train the child to go to the toilet when they feel like they need to and not hold it in? Um, failing this, then a stimulant or failing this, then you might use lactulose and a fecal softener. In pregnancy, we would generally advise for the use of bulk forming laxatives, failing this an osmotic laxative, and then failing that still by sacodal, but definitely not senna as it can stimulate uterine contractions near term. Failing this, ducasic sodium or glycerol suppositories. And for breastfeeding, um, the recommendations are exactly the same. I hope that all makes sense. Um, that being said, if you do have any questions, then we are here at Microfarm to support you. Um, but I wish you all the best, and I will see you in the next component of gastro and gastroenterology. Um, but take care until then. Right, so hello again, everyone. My name is Nketia, and I'm one of your clinical educators on the Microfarm platform. And we're continuing on with chapter one, which is gastroenterology or the gastrointestinal system in the BNF. And we're going to be looking at diarrhea, at least the topic, not obviously the pictures, um, in today's session. Now, as I've said before, understanding the clinical side of the GPHC assessment really comes down to thinking about the context of the content that you're trying to learn. Remember that this isn't just a case of remembering facts for the sake of remembering facts. You're learning all this clinical knowledge in the hope that you should be able to successfully advise a patient or a, you know, the healthcare professional or both based on the guidelines that you are learning and how to manage these conditions. That being said, it's really important that you read this content multiple times. It's a completely unfair and actually unrealistic expectation that you'll read the BNF once and then expect yourself to know it to an exam standard. I know that when I was preparing for the registration assessment, I went over my BNF a good few times and that excludes me looking at any notes and then practicing any part of the questions as well, which I'd encourage you to do. Also remember that in terms of your therapeutic areas in part two, they'll all relate to clinical care and they're linked to key therapeutic areas. An individual question may link to multiple therapeutic areas as well. Um, so for example, a patient may be described who has hypertension and type two diabetes. And the weighting of the individual therapeutic areas is generally reflective of how many high risk medications you have, um, how prevalent the diseases are, and how much input you are likely to have as a pharmacist and their importance. So things like hypertension, like let's say cardiovascular, the immune system, and neurology are all high weighted. Um, gastrointestinal, on the other hand, is medium weighted with things like vaccines um, and your anesthesia being very low weighted. Now, that doesn't mean that because gastro is medium weighted, you ignore it. Um, it just means that you would prioritize that after you've consolidated your learning on your high weighted topics. OK, so you can see that gastrointestinal is a medium weighted topic. OK, so keep that in mind. And ultimately, in terms of takeaway messages here, it's not impossible. You can do this. Remember that as part of your M Farm degree, you would have gone over these clinical areas. And so if you're able to do that now or then um, and get to where you are now successfully, I have no doubt that you will be able to learn this content again um, with the view of passing the registration assessment that the GPHC will give you later on this year. So in terms of a bit of a background on diarrhea, um, remember that diarrhea is defined as the abdominal passing of loose or liquid stools with increased volume or frequency. With all the symptoms listed being related to frequent loose stools um, and the consistency of the stools being more watery than solid. And generally any treatment would aim to reverse or preserve fluid um, yeah, reverse or preserve fluid or reverse fluid loss uh, and then prevent any electrolyte depletion and manage possible dehydration. So one thing that we often use in clinical practice is the Bristol stool chart. And quite often what you'll have uh, is you may ask a patient, OK, well, what do your stools look like? And if we're looking at diarrhea, you're really looking at type six to seven. At that point, you're sort of thinking, OK, what's going on here? Now, what's really important to remember is with diarrhea, the problem is that a patient is losing a lot of fluid and therefore electrolyte depletion is entirely possible. Dehydration as a consequence is also possible. 
So your main port of call here is going to be oral rehydration therapy, which is suitable for all ages. Generally, you have diarolite, which will contain ingredients like glucose, rice powder, sodium chloride, and potassium chloride. In the absence of this, uh, you have race kidotrol instead, which is an adjunct to rehydration therapy, has a similar efficacy to loperamide. Most common side effect would be headaches. You then have your antidiarrheals like loperamide, and these aim to reduce gastric motility by acting as an opioid derivative. You can't use it in children under the age of 12 or in pregnant women or women who are breastfeeding. With an initial dosing of four milligrams, which you may know as two capsules initially, and then two milligrams after each loose stool for up to a maximum of five days and a maximum of 60 milligrams per day. In terms of your side effects, you're looking at QTC prolongation, torsade de points, cardiac arrest, dizziness, flatulence, headache, and nausea. You might be wondering, well, why would I use naloxone if overdose occurs? Remember that the paramide works on your immune receptors, again, similar to your opioids. So that's why you would lose naloxone. In terms of your red flags for diarrhea, what you're really thinking about is unexplained weight loss, rectal bleeding, persistent diarrhea, systemic illness, recent hospital treatment, antibiotics or treatment. And in these cases, the paramide is not advised. Now, there are two immediate instances that you may come across. In primary care, you may come across a patient who says, oh, I feel like I've got, I've got a bit of a food bug. Can I have some loperamide? The answer to that is no, because if there is a bacterial element or any pathogenic element in the gut, the point of having all that diarrhea is to flush it out. So all you can really do is tell them, look, can't give you the paramide, have some oral rehydration therapy, ensure that you remain hydrated. And if, if you had, let's say you had a patient who had recent courses of, let's say, carboxyclaf, for instance, at that point you're thinking, okay, is this potentially C. diff? In which case you wouldn't give the paramide, but instead you would give them vancomycin, okay, um, or maybe fidoxamycin, depending on what microbiology recommend, and depending on how often they've had vancomycin, whether this is considered treatment failure. In terms of referral, if you have a baby who's less than three months, you would likely refer. If you have a child who's less than a year old and the symptoms have persisted for more than a day, you would refer. Diabetic patients, if symptoms have persisted for more than a day, again, you'd probably refer. And if you think, why diabetics? Well, just consider that if they develop dehydration due to all that fluid loss, they get pushed into hyperglycemia. Um, so that's worth thinking about, like DKA or HHS, depending. You have cases where if you have an adult or a child who experienced diarrhea for more than three days, you consider referring. And children under the age of three who have experienced diarrhea for two more days, again, you'd consider referring. I hope that all made sense. If it didn't, please do reach out to us here at Microfarm. We are here to support you. But I wish you all the best and I will see you in the next part of the gastroenterology or gastrointestinal module. But take care until then. Right, so hello again everyone, my name is Inketia and I am one of your clinical educators on the Microfarm platform and in this session we're going to be looking at Stomacare as part of uh, part one of the... Right, so hello again everyone, my name is Inketia, I am one of the clinical educators on the Microfarm platform and in this video, we are going to be looking at stoma care as part of chapter one of the BNF, which is all about the gastrointestinal system. Now, as far as your success for the clinical component of the GPHC assessment, really it comes down to understanding the clinical side. And when I say understanding it, I don't mean just remembering facts for the sake of remembering facts. You need to sort of think about everything in context. So for instance, the topic that we're going to look at today, stoma care, is you then thinking about how this links to your pharmaceutics and thinking about the practicality of giving a certain dosage form. So yes, you can give someone a capsule that's modified release, but if this patient has a stoma, let's say an ileostomy, will it work the way that you want it to? So please think about the clinical content that you're learning in context of the patients that you're likely to see. Also remember that you're learning all of this, not just for remembering facts, but also with the view that when you qualify, you're going to give a patient, another healthcare professional, or even both, some advice on the safe management of medication. 
Also remember to read your content multiple times because it's a completely unfair expectation to read something once and then try and remember it to an exam standard. Also try and apply your knowledge to questions earlier on. Remember as well that in terms of your therapeutic areas, questions in part two that relate to clinical care are linked to key therapeutic areas. A question can link to two different therapeutic areas. So it can link to cardiovascular uh, and endocrine, for instance. And the weighting of these different therapeutic areas is generally reflective of the importance of them, how much input that we will have as pharmacists and the prevalence of them. So things like your cardiovascular system, neurology and the immune system are all high weighted topics with gastrointestinal um, and genital urinary being medium weighted topics. And then things like uh, anesthesia, um, not anesthetists, um, um, anesthesia uh, and vaccines being low weighted. So what that means is after you've gone through your high weighted topics, I would expect that gastrointestinal uh, enterology or your gastrointestinal system similar to your other medium weighted topics are then focused on it next in terms of prioritizations so you can see here that your GI system is a medium weighted topic and ultimately in terms of takeaway messages it's not impossible you can do it because you've done it before as an MFARM student you're more than capable of doing it now but with all of that being said let's jump into stomacare so what is a stoma? Um, for those of you who are maybe based more in primary care and haven't come across stoma patients as much, um, or even some of you who are based in secondary care and have not had a surgical rotation yet, a stoma is an artificial opening on the abdomen to divert the flow of feces or urine into an external pouch. A stoma can be temporary or permanent. Um, the reason for it may be that you need to remove part of the bowel. This could be because of a colorectal cancer they used to be resected. Um, it could be in very severe cases of ulcerative colitis where they've been able to remove part of the bowel. Now your colostomy and ileostomy are probably the more common types of stoma, but a gastronomy, a jejunostomy, and a duodenostomy, uh, all of these could also be performed as well. And what's also important is to understand the type and extent of surgical intervention. That doesn't mean that you need to become surgeons by any means. It just means that you need to have an awareness and appreciation of the terms that we're referring to. So when I say an ileostomy, what part of the gut has been diverted into this pouch? If I say a colostomy, again, what does that mean? And what's the implication in terms of the medications that you may be supplying? So if you think about a colostomy, you see here that you've got your colon that's been removed. And so the pouch is in here. An ileostomy, you can see that's part of the small intestine, this is like your ileum. So that is where um, your pouch has been formed. So again, it's worth thinking a little bit about the potential site of the stoma and therefore the implication in mass management. Generally, a few main points here. We strongly advise not to use enteric coated or modified release formulations purely because there may be insufficient release of the active ingredient. We generally advise powders, liquids, soluble tablets, or capsules or other uncoated preparation forms. Capsules are a bit of a controversial area, and generally what we will say is if you are going to use a capsule because there's no other dosage form, then just check the stomach bags for any remnants because it's not unheard of that you can give someone a capsule and the capsule just ends up floating in the stoma bag, um, completely undissolved, okay? Opioid analgesics may cause constipation in colostomy patients and preparations containing sorbitol as an excipient may have a laxative effect. So what that means is if you had a patient where you had to convert the medication formulations uh, as a factor that they have a stoma, you may not opt for the liquid every single time because of that higher uh, amount of sorbitol. Generally, aspirin, uh, not <laughs> aspirin and NSAIDs uh, may cause gastric irritation and bleeding. Um, so generally, we would monitor fecal output for any traces of blood. And acids can also affect patients with stoma, and it depends on which antacid and it depends on which stoma uh, they have. So calcium containing antacids will cause constipation, and magnesium containing antacids will cause diarrhea, particularly in ileostomy patients as well. Aluminium hydroxide can cause constipation in colostomy patients. So again, 
these are all things we sort of think about in context. We also try and avoid iron preparations because these can also cause diarrhea in ileostomy patients. Um, one thing that we tend to see a lot of, and granted this is a side effect for all patients who take iron, it's not just those who have stoma, um, but we also know that oral iron okay, uh, can cause black stools to be formed. And there are many patients who will stop taking um, oral iron for that reason, because they find it embarrassing. Um, in the case of stoma patients, you could find that the stoma bag or the pouch uh, may be a stained color as well, which might make it more challenging for you uh, to look in the bag to see, oh, are there any capsules left? So what we may say in that instance is we may opt for parenteral iron instead, like let's say monifer or ferinject, both of which are IV. Um, patients with stomas are also at an increased vulnerability to water and electrolyte depletion. That could be diuretics or that could be laxatives as well. It's also worth that stoma output, i.e. the rate of peristalsis, is controlled by antidiarrheal drugs like loperamide and I suppose codeine to a certain extent. Both of these work on the mu receptor, so both of these will slow down gastric motility as a means of regulation. But keep in mind that it's not unheard of to see much higher doses of loperamide and codeine in cases where you're using it for stoma control rather than for diarrhea and analgesia respectively. But that's it from me. I hope that all made sense. If it didn't, please reach out to us here at Microfarm. We're here to support you. But I wish you all the best, and I'm sure I will see you in the next part of this GI module. But take care until then.